Good evening and welcome to our service tonight. I'm glad that you're able to be here. And if you're joining us online, glad that you're able to tune in. And uh, we had a great service this morning and we're looking forward to another great service tonight as we open God's word. But before the message tonight, we're going to sing a couple of hymns. So the first hymn we'll sing tonight is Tis So Sweet, The Trust in Jesus. And why don't we stand tonight as we sing Tis So Sweet, The Trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, pray. Precious Jesus, all oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood. Just in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him. How I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it is sweet to trust in Jesus, sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace jesus jesus how i trust him how i proved him more and more jesus jesus precious jesus all for grace to trust him more i'm so glad i learned to trust him Precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know that he is with me, will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, Oh, for grace to trust him more. And you may be seated as we sing, Seek ye first. Seek ye first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you Alleluia, Alleluia where two or three are gathered in my name there am I in their midst and whatsoever as I will do singing this evening. All right, take your Bibles and turn to Revelation chapter number 14. Revelation chapter number 14, as Pastor Matt mentioned, it was a great service this morning, and uh, it's uh, special to see uh, folks get baptized and the family join the church. It was wonderful and a great spirit, and uh, some visitors out this morning as well, which is fantastic. And uh, don't stop uh, working on people. You know, uh, there was a fellow who came out this morning who I never thought would darken the door of our church, but he came all from the other side of Toronto, and he came, sat back there, and listened and things. So you don't know. Just keep on plugging. Uh, keep on shining that light for Jesus the best you can, and uh, see what the Lord will do. And uh, I would ask you, we are doing our 30 days of prayer, and... Um, I would ask you to be in prayer 
Um, it's going to sound a little bit self-serving, but it, I'll, I'll explain it. I'll be asking you to pray for our pastors, myself, Pastor Matt, other pastors that you know. Um, I, I enjoy reaching out to pastors. I write pastors, encouraging notes when I get opportunity. And um, when you show yourself friendly, people will talk to you. Don't you find that? I know that's how it works, that's how, because that's how the Bible says it. And I've had the opportunity to meet some or make some new friends that way. And just in the last little while, I have had pastors contact me and tell me about family problems. They talk to me about the problems in their church, uh, just what's going on in our world. Um, I thought some pastor friends in Newfoundland this past weekend with the hurricane that went through, they lost power. And I mean, no, no, they weren't in life hazardous situations, but, you know, it's all not fun, right? When you lose power, it's not fun. And, uh, you know, we just need to pray for pastors. And we need to pray for more pastors, too. Uh, we need so many more in our country uh, filling the pulpits and leading congregations. So I'd ask you to pray for that this week. Uh, in your 30 days of prayer, let's be in prayer for our pastors. Revelation chapter 14, and we're going to start down in verse number 14. Revelation 14, verse number 14. And I looked, and I behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time is come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped, Another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar and which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully, uh, grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in the sickle into the earth and cast the vine of the, of the earth and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridle by the space, and six of a thousand six hundred furloughs. Let's look to our Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, uh, thank you for a wonderful day you've given to us. And Lord, as we come this evening, Lord, I pray that you encourage us by your word. And there's much here uh, that is of your judgment, but Lord, help us to be encouraged uh, that as saved individuals, we have the opportunity to lead others to you and that we escape the wrath to come. And Lord, I pray that you just encourage our hearts now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So just a little review again of the revelation. The first uh, three chapters is about uh, the churches uh, that were existing in John's time. He wrote letters to chapters 4 to 11 is a chronological uh, you know, record of the tribulation period takes us from the beginning to the end. And in chapters 12 to 14, we're almost done this section. It gives us the same time, but it's not chronological. Now it's looking at individuals. Uh, we've looked at a bunch of different individuals, characters that have been confronted. And uh, when this chapter ends, we're going to be thrown back into the heat as such and the horrors uh, the final days of tribulation. But before that, John gives us a vision of the Lord again in power and in glory. So when Jesus came the first time, he came as a... I'm going to get some interaction tonight. He came as what? Nice and loud? He showed love, yes? He came as a Savior, right? Lamb, that's it. Exactly, he came as a lamb. He came to you know, pave the penalty of sin. I said all sinners might be free if they accept the gift. He comes a second time as what? He's not coming as a lamb or a savior. He's coming as judge. Totally different. All right? Totally different. And when Jesus returns, he's going to come. It's not going to be in a manger, right? It's not going to be humble. He's going to come with might and power. And there will be no... Hmm, I wonder if he really is who he says he is. No, we will know, and the world will know that he is king, and there will be a crown. He'll come. He's the ruler. 
All right, so the Lord and his return, and verse number 4, the image in verse 14 is the Son of Man. This is Jesus Christ. This is whom uh, John is writing about. There, let there be no confusion. That is who he is. Uh, that's one of the titles the Lord Jesus uh, used when he referred, even when he was on earth. Actually, it was used 84 times in, uh, in the Gospels. It uh, was one of, the way, one of the most often ways that he referred to himself as the Son of Man. Uh, so that uh, identifies Jesus with mankind, right? He's come for mankind, the Son of Man. It's his human title speaks of suffering, right? That's what it speaks of. Uh, suffering. Uh, he served. Did he not hear when in the Gospels we saw he served? He sacrificed. Uh, and when John sees the Son of Man in the clouds, he's seen the one who's come to this earth, who gave his life a ransom, but he's returning. And Luke 1, 21, 27 says that he'll come, and they shall see the Son of Man come, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When John sees Jesus, he sees him wearing a golden crown in verse number 14. The word crown refers to a victor's crown. So victorious, he's the victor. And uh, refers to the laurel wreaths that were given to the victors in the ancient Greek games. The fact that this is, uh, crown is golden identifies as king. He's a king. He is the king. Okay, this is who Jesus Christ is. When Jesus Christ came the first time, you know, he is the son of a carpenter. But we won't see him as the son of a carpenter when he comes to earth the second time. All right? He won't be seen as Jesus Nazareth. He won't be seen as the son of Mary. When John sees him, and again, this is for the future, he sees him as the king of kings and lord of lords. There's no one greater. He's the one who comes forth to destroy Satan, and he gets the victory. He's gotten the victory. He's the one who shed his blood. Uh, he's defeated sin. He liberates sinners. He would liberate all sinners who will come to him. And he's the one who walked out of the tomb. Amen. Isn't that amazing? Walked out of the tomb. And so he's the one that John sees, the king who, who's in possession of his domain. He is in possession. When Jesus comes back, there will be no debate. The United Nations or any other international body won't convene a special session or vote to say whether he can reign or rule. He will rule. That's done. He, what he says goes. And when he comes, he'll be wearing that golden crown of the victor, the golden crown of the king, and he will rule. And Jesus will not ask permission from men to rule this world. He will not ask. He will assume the throne that's rightfully his and he'll rule this world, all right? And that means that he's defeated all. There will be no one divide, be, you know, coming against him. He will rule by his right as creator. And his power, when we see John sees the king here, and he has a sharp sickle. Uh, I don't know, have, have any of you here ever used the sickle? Anybody? Has anyone seen it used, like not on a flag or anything, but, you know, in the farmer's field, some have us, okay. Has anyone used one? Yeah, okay, you. You. <laughs> and Mark too? Mark? All right, so a couple of us have used it, Roger, Mark. Uh, I've seen it, and I've swung it around a few times, and then my mom yelled at me to put it down, afraid I was going to hurt somebody. Uh, I have no real experience with it, but I understand it, that it was a tool used uh, you know, they'll cut down the wheat and in that day, and obviously later still, it's still, still, I still, I still know people back in Newfoundland who use it to cut the hay for their horses. Uh, so the reality is still used. And uh, the idea here, um, when Jesus returns, he's going to gather the people into his barn as a farmer gathers his wheat, and he'll, you know, cut down the wicked. And we'll see that in a few moments as we go forward. So the reality is, Jesus can either be your savior or he's going to be your judge. That's the only two, only two possible things he's going to be. He's going to be your savior, or he's going to be your judge. And the decision on which one he is, it lays totally in your lap as such. You decide. Will I accept Christ as my savior? Then he is my savior. If I reject him, he will be my judge. All right? Uh, so the choice is yours. So verses 15 down to 19, we see... Uh, 
the sickle being used and the reaping, okay? The next four verses unfold our Lord's plan to bring judgment to this earth. Uh, again, when he came the first time, you know, when he came the first time, he was sowing seed, wasn't he? The Lord was sowing seed. He was telling others of his love. He was telling others of the plan of salvation. Now he comes through, and now he, he's, he's using that sickle. He's reaping. And, and when he returns, he comes as the reaper, and he will separate the saint from the sinner. And there, no one's going to sneak into heaven. You probably have heard someone say that. Well, I'll try to sneak in. No, no, no one's sneaking in. Okay, again, there's only two positions. He's your savior or he's your judge. That's it. All right. And uh, the two harvests described in these verses, uh, the harvest time in the Bible is often a picture of souls coming to God. Uh, in John chapter 4, verses 34 and 35, in those verses, the harvest is used as a picture of judgment. So we see the reaping of grain in verses 15 and 16. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him, that sat in the cloud, thrust in thy sickle, and reap, and for the time is to come for thee to uh, reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat in the cloud thrust in the sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Uh, so, that, you know, we see Jesus thrusting in that sickle to, uh, to reap the world. And uh, the Lord takes the sickle, and he does that. And when we see these fulfillment of the parables of Jesus in the Gospels, Matthew uh, 13, 24 to 20, uh, 30, Jesus talked about the wheat and the tear. Uh, it's the story of the farmer who sowed the wheat field, right? He did the hard work, sowed it, uh, expecting a bountiful harvest. But then his enemy came in, and he sowed tares amongst the wheat. And the servants said, let's go in and pull out the tares. And the Lord says, no, because that will destroy the wheat. He said, we'll wait till they all come up, and then... When we reap the harvest, we'll take out the tares. We'll take out, we'll, we'll get the wheat. And in that same chapter in Matthew, a little later on, Jesus tells the disciples what that parable meant. And that meant that the good seed represented genuine believers, those who trusted Christ as Savior, and the tares represented those who were false, who were not believers. And the good seed represented the saved, tares represented the lost. The problem with wheat and the tares. Now, I am not... A agricultural guy, okay? Fishing, I'm right up there. I kind of know some things about that, but wheat and things, I have no idea. I, I remember when I first when I first moved to Brampton, 11 over 11 years ago, uh, I didn't know what beans were. I mean, I ate lots of beans in my time, but I didn't know what a bean plant looked like. And I remember we lived in a farm. Uh, we rented a little trailer, uh, and it was like 70 feet long with three rooms. And uh, before our house sold Newfoundland, so we lived on a farm, and uh, this all green stuff came up, and I didn't have a clue what it was. And I asked people, I was like, what's that? Now, I knew what corn was. I've seen that before, but you know, I have no idea about anything agricultural. Uh, but from what I'm told, that when there's tares in with wheat, at first there's no way to tell the difference. There is absolutely no way. But as it grows, as it gets close to the time when you're going to reap the the harvest, the tail, the tails show up. The, the tares actually turn a different color. As the wheat, and this is pretty interesting, the tares will stand up straight. The wheat w will bow down with the weight. Isn't that an ind indication of our hearts as well? As Christians, we bow down to our Savior, and the tares are standing up in defiance as such to God. Uh, so that's how they know it, and obviously the color is different by then as well. So the farmer uh, can remove the uh, tares from it. One day, Jesus will gather all the genuine believers unto himself, and the wicked will be cut down and cast in the furnace of fire. And, uh, and the judgment of the Lord has come. The Lord knoweth them that are his. Uh, there's, no worry, there's no way you're going to sneak in, and there's no worry that you're going to be left out. Amen? The Lord knows. You know Christ is Savior. The Lord's not going to forget you. I'm, and I'll be honest, I had so many, as a kid, I had so many terrifying moments that my mom left me somewhere. Go to the store, you know, uh, Wool Co. Can isn't anyone remember Wool Co.? I mean, before Walmart and all that, I mean, go into Wool Co. and uh, go down the toy aisle when mom probably told me not to do it. But I'm there just Google gaggling over all the toys and mom is way down the other end and all of a sudden I'm like, she's forgotten me. I'm all by myself. You know, type of thing. And, and you know, we get all upset, and then mom gets upset that you left her. You know, it's not a good scene. Kids don't do that, okay? Uh, but 
We never have to worry about the Lord forgetting us. We're His. We're His forever. Amen? That should give us a great deal of a peace in our heart and joy. He won't forget us. We won't get left behind or get forgotten. The word ripe, back to the context here in the verses, the word ripe is an interesting word. It means to be dried or withered. So it's the idea of overripe. You know, it's, it's, it's good to go. And it's a bit of a picture of the grace of God. It means sending into this world, but God continues with His grace. He continues with His mercy, withholding judgment, giving more time for men to receive the gift of salvation, to repent. But one day... His patience will be exhausted. I, I, when I, I think about this, and I think about some moms. I've seen moms who just, day in and day out, you know, that little one has been pushing the buttons, pushing the buttons, and you can see the, the growing judgment coming, shall we say. It's coming, and you're like, you want to smack that little one on the side of the head and say, hey, you better watch out. You better stop or something bad's going to happen. They don't see it. They don't see it. And then, boom, it happens. Right, moms and dads? You know, it happens. And the reality is it's needed to happen. It needs the correction and things. But with this situation, when this happens, it's final. This correction is final. The men and women on the earth, when that judgment happens, their lives are over and there's an eternity in hell. Okay, uh, we see the, the reaping of the grapes as well uh, in verses 17 to 19. Now, now the scene changes from the field to the vineyard, and the lost are compared to the fields of grapes that are ripe to uh, the bursting. They're ready to be harvested. So um, a wine press. So back in this day, in the day that John would have been writing about, they would have had a the wine press would have consisted of two vats connected by a channel. So one vat would be where they would put all the grapes and they would stomp on them, like you see in the movies. You know, that's, I've never actually seen this in real life, but uh, you get in that vat and you're walking around on the grapes. Has anyone done that? Anyone here? All right, no. So, okay, just checking. I was going to ask you some questions after, but at any rate... Uh, and when they crush them, obviously there's juice, and they run down a, a duck work as such to the lower vat, uh, and that's where the juices would be. Uh, and then, you know, they would go on to make the, the wine from there. And here again, the picture of the world slated for judgment. That's what we're seeing. The world has rejected the true vine. The true vine is Jesus Christ, John chapter 15. They have attached themselves to the world. All right, so this is at the end of the tribulation time. By this time, they have attached themselves to the Antichrist and the beast, false prophet. They've rejected the God of glory. The world has rejected God. They've rejected Jesus Christ. And now they face judgment, right? Jesus is either Savior or he's going to be your judge. That's what it is. And he will crush the world system. We look around our world today and we're like, it's so close, amen? The Lord's coming so soon. We see stuff happening, and we're like, wow, we can just see the, how it's being prepared, and there's no way to stop it. But one day, the Lord will crush it, because he is the ruler. He is king. He will rule this world, and uh, he will crush it like a grape. And this is the images that come from the coming king. You can read about it in Isaiah chapter 63. Jesus is going to come in wrath, and there will be no escape. The enemies of God will be thrown in the wine press of his wrath, and they will be judged. And uh, so last, uh, verse 13, And the angel thrusted his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth, cast in the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the wine press, even unto the horses' bridles by the space of of 1,600 furlongs. So John finishes off this chapter in verse 20, uh, and he gives us some insight about the great judgment that's to come. And there's a day of reckoning, and a verse that you know um, kind of gives us some insight on a very horrible event, something very horrible. And uh, we see the Bible tells us the wine press was trodden without the city. This, is, this does not tell us where this event takes place, 
However, we're seeing here the, in this verse of a coming battle that we know as the Armageddon, the Battle of Armageddon, okay? And that's found in, in Revelation chapter 16 and verse number 16. And that is going to be a terrible event. It's going to be horrific. And uh, so this verse gives us just a little snapshot. We'll see more about it as we go ahead. But it gives us a little snapshot of what's happening. So Armageddon means the hill or city of Megiddo. And Megiddo is located on the plains of Estron. And this is located, some really famous uh, biblical battles have already taken place there. Uh, Barak and Deborah defeated the Canaanites there in Jude chapter 4 and 5. Um, can you remember that guy who was really afraid, one of the judges, and he put out a, a fleece a couple times? What was that guy's name? Gideon. And then he had a big army, and the Lord said, oh, it's too many. You know, and he reduced it down, reduced it down, till there was, how many? Does anyone know how many? 300. You've been reading your Bible. You know how heavy that makes me. All right, so 300. And they defeated the Midianites in the valley of Megiddo. Okay, Jude chapter 6, uh, Judges, sorry, chapter 6 and uh, to chapter 8. Um, same valley is the place that King Saul and his son Jonathan were killed in a battle in 1 Samuel chapter 31. Um, I really, the, the last good king of Judah, King Joash, died in this valley too, uh, in a battle in, in the valley of Megiddo. It's the same valley where the armies of the earth will come together. The armies of the earth will come together to attempt to destroy God. Just let that sit in for a second. The creation thinks we will destroy the creator. We are greater. We, they literally believe they are gods, that they could destroy God. So they come from all around the world, and it's uh, in this place, and Napoleon was there, and he's a, you know, he wasn't a Christian, but he was definitely a military man. And he said that the Valley of Mageddon is a natural battlefield just the way it's designed, the way the land lays. And there, oh, a massive battle will take place. The end of the tribulation happens there. The, the, the Lord returns. And we're told that his one, the, the, he, the wine press will be trodden. This means to crush with feet. Okay, it's a vivid description what Jesus will do to those who despise and reject him. And they all gather in this valley to come against him. And he will crush them. He will crush the enemies of God under his feet. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 12. But this, man, but this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for his sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth, expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. Listen, there's no enemy greater than the Creator. There is none. He'll be crushed under his feet. So, Again, it goes back to what I said at the beginning, Jesus is your Savior, so you can be held in his arms, or he's your judge, and you'll be, ju you'll, you'll be crushed by his feet. I mean, it's not a hard decision, right? You want to be, he, you need him to be your Savior, all right? That's what you need, and uh, to escape the wrath. Who wants the wrath? We want God's grace, amen? Well, that's what you should be after, God's grace, and accept him as Savior. Uh, we see the reckoning. Uh, we're witnessing total destruction here. Um, the, the image is one of violence and death that is really hard for us to comprehend. Uh, we're told that the blood, it says there, and the blood came out of the wine press. So it's very vivid because I just talked about the wine press and how it had two vats, you know, and they crushed it and the juices came out of the, the, the grapes into the lower vat. The Lord crushes the enemy, men who despise him, reject him, go against him, uh, and the blood came out of the wine press, even to the horse's bridle, by a space of 1,600 furloughs. So it was up to the horse's bridle. Blood. Human blood. That's, that's what it is. So that's between four and five feet deep. It will flow a river some 1,600 Furlongs long. Does anyone know how long a furlong is? Anybody? 
200 meters. Is that written in your Bible? Did you just know it off the top of your head? All right. <laughs> good man. No problem. No shame. <laughs> that's good. So uh, that's how long it is. So how long in total is that? 200 meters uh, is one furlong, and there's 1,600 furlongs. It's over 200 miles, over 321 kilometers. Uh, I don't know, but I mean, I studied this passage for last week and a half. I, I can't fathom that. I mean, I can think of it, and I even try to find out how long that is. So a distance is like from our church to down to Pastor Thiessen's house in Windsor. And actually, that's not even 321. It's close, but it's not exactly. That's how long. I mean, that's really, isn't that really hard to fathom? Like how long that is and how much blood that, I mean, oh, it's disturbing when you think about it. That, that, that's the destruction that will take place. It's really hard. It's hard to imagine that. And we, who wants to imagine that? Such death. Uh, you know, there's other, been other times in history, uh, Josephus, uh, he was a Jewish historian. He uh, talked about that there was so much blood shed when Titus sacked the city of Jerusalem that the blood that was spilled actually put out fires that had been started. I mean, and that's hard to understand too, isn't it? Like, that, that's, that's incredible. But the judgment, the armies of the world will come against God. And just remember what they're doing. They're coming to defy God. That's what they're doing. This, you know, they know what they're doing. It's not like, oopsie daisy, I found myself in the valley of Megiddo. No, they, they come with the purpose of defying God. Every weapon that man could muster, everything that they could do to throw at God, they're going to have there. And Jesus will return. And um, you know, the really amazing part is, and we, we don't see it in this portion of Scripture, we'll see it later on, you know, Jesus doesn't come to earth and start swinging a sword around. He will have a sword, but he speaks, and the armies are destroyed. He speaks. The power and authority of our God is incredible. Incredible. And he speaks, and the armies will be destroyed. And, and the winepress of the wrath. And multitudes upon multitudes of men and women will die in that battle. And the blood will fill that valley. And uh, it's sad that men could have accepted Jesus Christ. They could have accepted the gift the precious gift of salvation that was purchased with Jesus Christ's blood, right? But they reject it, and now they wallow in their own blood. And it's disturbing, but the reality is when you reject God, there will be wrath. There will be wrath. And we read these events, and it's really hard to fathom, comprehend the dev devastation. But isn't the Bible true? The Bible's true. I can believe it to be true. It's going to happen. It's in, it's in the future. Uh, but the old, even the Old Testament uh, prophets talked about the very events in Zechariah 14, Joel chapter 3. And the battle will take place and God will be victorious. So thousands of years ago in Egypt, God saved his people by the blood of a lamb, right? In Egypt. They killed that lamb. They placed the blood on the doorposts of the house. And when they did, they were safe and secure. As long as they were in the house, right? They were safe and secure. They were under the blood. And when that angel of death passed through the night, they were spared because they were under the blood. The question is for you is, where are you? Are you under the blood? Have you accepted Christ as Savior? Is Jesus your Savior? If he's not your Savior, then he's your judge. And it's not hard to change the position that from being judge to being your Savior. It's a simple act of trusting Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And I hope that you have done that. And if, if you haven't, this is the best time you have to do that. Accept Christ as Savior. If you're here or you're watching online, accepting Christ as Savior can be done anytime, any place in the world. Amen? It doesn't matter where you are. He will hear your cry. He will save you. And, and as believers, so you're saying, well, Pastor, 
He's my Savior. Well, praise the Lord. I'm so thankful for that. Uh, let's be making sure that our lives are ones that point others to Jesus. And we live in a world that's really contentious right now, right? It's pretty contentious. And we see, you can almost feel the divisiveness amongst people. And just to step out and live for Jesus, people will notice. And just point to the Lord and say, hey, the Lord's helping me. I don't have it all under I don't have it all under control by no means, but I am trusting the Lord to help me each and every day. And let's be asking the Lord in our prayer time to help that person to pass by who needs to hear the message. Let's be praying for those divine appointments uh, to witness and to reach out to folks and share that gospel. And uh, the reality is you're the only one who can keep, I mean, I understand the Lord helps us, but you're the one who keeps your testimony shining brightly. So keep it shining brightly. You know, ask the Lord to help you to be the best testimony you can be, and let's be bringing people to the Savior, helping them escape the wrath to come. Amen? Let's be looking towards that. All right, so I hope that helps you understand that chapter just a little bit more and uh, help us, encourage us as we serve the Lord. So uh, some upcoming things this week for us. Tuesday, podcast. We'll continue with our Old Testament survey uh, Wednesday, we'll have an update and challenge from the uh, Brother Goodman, our missionary to Mexico. That's going to be at 7 on Wednesday on our Facebook page. So I hope you'll take advantage uh, to watch that and then to help you to pray for them better. And then Saturday, 8.30 is Facebook devotion. And uh, men, we have golf tournament. If you sign up for that, I need to be uh, there at 9.30 at the golf course. And let's be in prayer. The weather will be nice. Wasn't today a great day? I'm going to tell you, I was encouraged. I mean, I'm encouraged when I come to church at any rate, but I was especially encouraged today. Uh, it was great to see so many folks out to church this morning and folks, again, that we've been working with and, and people out, visitors. It was so good. Uh, and I'm looking forward to next Sunday, Lord willing. If he takes us home, I'm grand with that too. But if he gives us another week, I look forward to next Sunday and, uh, you know, a we're calling it, welcome back to church. We'll have some cake for everyone. As you're like, I don't need any cake. I'll take it home anyway. All right, but we just look forward to being together, worshiping together. Uh, the church is important, amen? Gathering's important. And I'm literally looking forward to next Sunday. So folks, have a great week. Keep looking to Jesus. Keep redeeming the time. You're dismissed.